So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, so we will be talking today about the basics of the MBR technologies, advantages and disadvantages, uh, then the two main types of MBRs, the merchant side stream. Then I will be sharing with you some best practices for designing and operating such systems. Finally, I will be talking about the PCI membranes and uh, our technology and our products. We will wrap up and then have a Q&A session. So starting with the basics, probably something that most of you already know, but at least we are all on the same page. When we are talking about membrane filtration, it's about separating a liquid stream uh, in two components, permeate and concentrate where basically in the permeate, we have a lower concentration of the species we want to separate than in the feed. And obviously then in the concentrate, because we need to close the mass balance, we have a higher concentration of such species. Also the flow that comes in is split into, uh, in two. So of course the permeate is a bit smaller in quantity than the feed and the concentrate as well. Uh, in, in the cases of the MBR, with the feed we mean the mixed liquid that comes from the biological reactor, then the permeate is basically the pure water, I mean, not pure water, but I mean, the water that has been purified through the membrane without suspended solids so or without the biomass, which is then discharged into the receiving body or sent for further treatment. And with the concentrate, we mean the sludge that we separate. It's a bit like it happens in a clarifier for people like who are um, practice, uh, web practice with the conventional activated sludge system. So you separate the water from the sludge, in this case, uh, in the case of the clarified by gravity, in case of a membrane, because of the membrane itself. There are different types of membranes. And uh, from the microfiltration to the reverse osmosis, we go through smaller pores until a point where we cannot even recognize pore, the dense membrane. And the smaller the pores, the more substances and uh, compounds we can remove. With micro and ultra filtration, we can remove suspended solids and bacteria. So this is the preferred choice for MBR application because basically we need to remove the mix of the liquid, the activity sludge, which is nothing else than a lump of bacteria, protozoa, and so on. So in form of suspended solids. So micro and ultra filtration membrane are enough for this. The recent trend is more towards uh, open ultrafiltration because this way you can also remove uh, a good number of viruses. While tight ultrafiltration that removes also micromolecules is not practical in MBR um, because it would get dirty too quick, the membrane. So it's more for process application. And you can use nanofiltration and reverse osmosis membrane as a post-treatment to MBR to further remove some uh, uh, micropollutants, uh, uh, some contaminant of emerging concern like pesticide, herbicide, PFOS, and so on. So membrane technologies can be combined together. But for today, we'll mostly focus on micro and ultrafiltration membrane because this is what we use in MBR process. So a bit of definition about MBR, again, so that we are all on the same page. Um, so an MBR is basically combining a biological reactor conventional one activated sludge type, usually suspended growth, with um, uh, a membrane that, to separate the biomass. So we replace the clarifier and possibly also tertiary filtration treatment with a membrane that can be or immersed. So we can call this the submerged MBRs when the membrane is submerged into the activated sludge, or we can put the membranes into vessels and outside of the tank where we have the activated sludge, and it's called the side stream MBR. Each one has pros and cons that we will see later. Um, as you can see from this image, uh, the biological reactor is more or less the same thing. Uh, actually, as we will discuss later, it will get smaller because with membrane, we can sustain a higher concentration of biomass as we are not uh, dependent anymore from uh, the hydraulic loading in the clarifier and also the solid flux of the clarifier. So we're independent of the settleability of the sludge. And this means that we can push the process a bit more. We can have higher concentration because anyway, we will not have a trouble to separate them. The membrane basically has an absolute barrier for the sludge. Um, 
what are advantages and disadvantages of MBRs compared to the conventional activated sludge system? Well, the main advantage is the quality of the effluent you get out. Um, you can see also in this image, I mean, this is the mixed liquor. As you may notice from the color, this is an industrial wastewater treatment plant. And then you get a totally clear permeate. Me, uh, most of, uh, of the membrane used in MBR are ultra filtration rating, and so they can remove basically every solids uh, and most of the turbidity. And in case you want to use uh, then uh, um, nano filtration reverse osmosis post treatment, they also take uh, they also enable very good values of the uh, seal density index that is below three. So you don't need pretty much any pre treatment. You can put directly a nano filtration or a reverse osmosis uh, unit after. Uh, by retaining all the suspended solids, also we have a complete control over the sludge retention time, which is one of the most important design and operating parameters of uh, activated sludge plants. So it's really good because you know exactly how you're operating your, your plant and you are not losing sludge through the clarifier. Mm, compared to conventional system, also the footprint, as we already hinted, is, is smaller because we can uh, tolerate higher concentration of biomass in the biological reactor. And also we can skip any tertiary treatment and also the clarifiers because clarifiers are usually bigger than the, the uh, they require more footprint than the membrane filtration unit. Let it be submerged or, uh, or side stream. And then in case of uh, industrial uh, effluence is really interesting because you have a different selection mechanism on the biomass. You are not selecting the biomass that stays in the activated sludge plant uh, based on its settleability, how well it's settled down in the clarifier, but you have a, a membrane that retains all the bacteria. So you are, over time, you will be selecting the most efficient bacteria to biodegrade the type of uh, wastewater you want to treat. So if you have some compounds that are difficult to biodegrade, you will have slightly better removal rates because of this. And finally, um, as we are not depending again on the sludge suitability, we can automate the process better. Um, because uh, this is a, we are operating with all parameters we can measure with instruments. And so we can have full automation of the, of the system. And this is an advantage in case of the remote location or in case of industrial system, because of course, most of our uh, of, uh, industrial uh, companies that have, you need a wastewater treatment plant, they don't have as primary purpose and uh, operating a wastewater treatment plant. So the less effort they need to do to operate this plant, the better. Of course, there are some disadvantages. I mean, every technology has pro and cons. So it's important to know the disadvantages so we can choose the MBR technology when it's really uh, convenient for the end user. That is the most important thing. Um, so it, it is more expensive than a conventional, un, uh, than a conventional system uh, if you just look until the clarifier. Uh, and in some cases, it's even cheaper even if you look at the clarifier because you can make the concrete tank smaller, but membrane comes with a price, obviously. If you start that you need to add already a sand filter after the clarifiers, uh, membrane system can, be, can easily match all of this. Uh, in terms of cost. So as soon as you re require tertiary treatment, uh, an MBR system is convenient. You have also higher operating costs because you need to keep the membrane clean. Uh, and also it's slightly more difficult to array the biomass because it's more concentrated. But this can be amended by the fact that you can choose not to high biomass concentration. And also it was over the last 10 years, the scouring air consumption really dropped a lot because there was a lot of product development uh, in the technology. So right now, mm, most of the, uh, the MBR products require little air for, for, keep, uh, for keeping them clean. And this has really reduced the cost a lot. Uh, one more thing is handling of peak flows. This is mostly an issue with uh, municipal wastewater treatment, not much for industrial. Uh, and so you need to design the system in, in the proper way so that you consider also when you have peak flows and then you can choose to oversize the membrane filtration section a bit or to have a conventional system parallel, for example. There are many ways to handle this issue. So um, Also, 
three treatments are a bit uh, uh, required to be a bit better overall in terms of fine screening because membranes are, are more sensitive than clarifier, obviously. So you need to spend a bit more also for, for the pretreatments, but it's worth because you reduce the operational problem, not just in the membrane session, but the less, you know, coarse particle you bring in the system, also the better it is for the activated sludge, and you end up also producing less sludge with that. Um, then you, if, you are, if you want to operate a nitrogen removal, biological nitrogen removal with a pre-denitrification configuration, you need to take into account that you're recirculating a mix of the liquid that is rich in oxygen from the membrane unit, uh, unless you're using a size term reactor, obviously. So you need eventually to put a deoxygenation tank or to split the recycle. And finally, you need to train the personnel to operate the membrane system. It's not the same as clarifier, so different type of knowledge is required, but everything can be, uh, can be taught to operators, obviously. So we have seen the pros, we have seen the cons. When do we use these MBRs? Well, when we need to respect street discharge standards and possibly tertiary treatment are needed. If we need to have low COD, if we need to have low nitrogen phosphorus um, and remove bacteria and possibly microplastics, MBR are a good choice. Um, as they retain all the suspended solids, you don't have a loss of uh, COD, nitrogen, and phosphorus with effluent with the suspended solids because you know that the activated sludge has a COD value associated to it, a phosphorus, and a nitrogen value. Uh, if you want to recycle or use water, also it's great because uh, uh, in some application, depending on also on the on the type of wastewater that you are treating. You can directly reuse the water for non-potable purposes like irrigation or truck washing, things like that after MBR. Otherwise, you can easily put some membrane treatment and uh, you can do uh, put direct or indirect potable reuse, for example, if you have the right post-treatment after the MBR. Um, if you have industrial effluents with a high organic content, or slowly biodegradable organic compounds. Again, MBRs are really efficient, as we already discussed. If you have limited footprint, again, MBR can make a wastewater treatment plant very compact. And again, industrial sites usually don't have that much space available. For example, look at this picture here. There was not much place to put a wastewater treatment plant around here, so MBR was more or less the choice to go. Uh, if you're upgrading an existing plant, a uh, conventional one, then you can easily increase the capacity without building extra tanks by putting membranes into usually the clarifiers. Um, we already discussed about the centralized sites as it is fully automated technology, it's easy to, uh, to operate them. And then you can remove things like micropollutants and enable the removal of contaminant of emerging concern. So this is when we want to use MBRs. I already mentioned that there are two types of uh, MBRs. Now we look how they quickly, how they function. Of course, it's quite, uh, it would take a lot of time to go in details, but I can give at least a quick overview. The merge MBR uh, um, have modules or cassette, how you call them, it depends on the supplier, that are immersed in the activated Large. It can be either directly in the biological reactor, and this is common for small plants, or in case of larger plants, and as it represented here, they are into a dedicated tank. Then you apply a little bit of vacuum with the permeate extraction pump on the membrane so that you can suck out the water from the mixed liquid. And then this water goes to the permeate holding tank from where it's discharged or reused. Um, to keep the membrane clean in some of the system, we use air scouring. So we inject air under the membrane modus or cassette. They have dedicated air diffuser to basically keep the membrane clean and to, do, to the concentrate the mix of the liquid on the membrane surface. Then at a the time we stop sucking water uh, in, in order to have the membrane relax. So no suction is anymore applied on the membrane, and then this air scouring is even more efficient in cleaning the membrane. Some, some submerged membrane can be backwashed, and so you can reverse the permeate extraction 
to push some permeate back to again help clean in the membrane. And finally, at the time, it's, it's needed to go even a deeper cleaning. And then you start dosing chemicals through this uh, uh, dosing units here directly on if the membrane can be backwards on the, on the pipe or for the permeate extraction. And you add chemicals to it to clean better the substances that are making the membrane dirty, the so called fouling. We'll talk about fouling later. Sidestream MBR is the other configuration where we have external modules that where the membranes are, are uh, installed inside vessels. And here we have we are basically pumping uh, the mixed liquid to the to the membrane. And thanks to this uh, positive pressure, we produce uh, some permeate that then gets discharged or used. And the remaining fraction of the mixed liquid is recirculated back to the reactor or this and partially discharges wasted activity sludge. Again, we can perform a relaxation with the same principle. Um, we basically open, in this case, the back pressure valve to create to avoid any back pressure on the membrane, so we are not permeating, and we just get the mixed liquid to uh, to run through the membranes, cleaning them. Uh, we can some can be backwashed, so we can apply a little uh, backwash flux. Usually, it's very low, so it's negligible, and in most cases, it's enough just to relaxation. And then finally, we can chemically clean. Again, here we create a diluted solution in a dedicated tank called CAP tank. And with a pump, we circulate this solution through the membrane to clean it. So this is a very high level view how this type of system work. Um, when do we use one or the other? So uh, in terms of effluent quality and uh, waste activity is large generation, they are the same, I mean. As long as the membrane has the same rating, they will perform the same. But the different type of configuration gives advantages and disadvantages to each, uh, to each type, of merger of size stream. For example, size stream is very convenient if you want to have very high suspended solids concentration in the biological reactor, for example, industrial sites, to limit the footprint as much as possible. Uh, you can also have higher fluxes because you are using higher pressure to drive the water through the membrane. So you can, again, reduce the footprint. Um, also, you can save on installation cost because uh, you can usually make a prefabricated system that is really easy and quick to install. So you come on site usually with skids of containers. And they use less chemicals because uh, the volume that needs to be cleaned is smaller. And finally, maintenance is easier as uh, you are not you don't need, do not need to take out memory cassette or modules from an activity sludge tank so that makes things easy on the other hand they require more energy so uh, because uh, you need to apply a positive pressure that is quite high i mean we're talking about anywhere between 3 to 7 bars uh, and also is different concept where you need to keep the membrane clean by applying a cross flow so you're pumping a high flow rate through the membrane to keep it clean. While with submerged membranes, you are using air to keep them clean and uh, is and at a low pressure. So it's much easier to pump air at a low pressure than water at a higher pressure. Uh, and this way you can save energy. Additionally, usually submerged membrane have a longer membrane lifetime, even if this is not because of the member itself, it's mostly because of the application. They are used in less challenging application. So when do we use submerged and when do we use size term? Well, we use submerged every time we can because they are cheaper to operate. So this is usually what, if you look at the project in to a lifespan or at least the seven years, if not 10, 12 years, is much cheaper. You have a lower topic. The total expenditure is lower for submerged system. But in some cases, you need to use size time because a submerger will not perform that well. And this is when you have low biodegradable industrial effluent. And also, they can be convenient for small and medium system because you want to make it them really compact and easy to operate. And this is the case for industrial effluent, again, usually. Um, a typical example of size stream reactors is with the landfill leachate, but also for some in the industrial effluent like dairy, when you have not that much space available, Maybe your there is located in into you know town, and so they can, they don't have uh, uh, endless space to build a wastewater treatment plant, so it can be really interesting. 
So now let's look at the best practices to design this type of systems. To design an MBR in the proper way, first you know, and foremost, obviously, you need to know what is what is the wastewater that is entering the system. So you need to know the quantity. So we are talking about what is the average daily flow, the peak hourly flow. For municipal wastewater, where you have a mixed sewage system, you want also to know uh, peak daily flow, peak weekly flow, peak monthly flow, and so on. But in most cases, average daily and peak hourly are enough. Then you need to know what is the quality of the water. So you're looking at non-ionic and ionic components, and also as well temperature, pH, and so on. I'm not reading the list. I mean, it's quite self-explanatory. Uh, and more for most wastewater treatment system, you need to know this data. I will talk what needs to be uh, carefully taken care of later on. So we will see what is uh, what are the tricky parts for MBRs. And finally, we need to consider which type of quality do we want to reach. Do we need redundancy in the system? What is the available footprint? Because as we discussed, this drives the choice between the submerged or um, or side stream. And then if there is any existing tanks or reactors that we can use. And then depending on the application, of course, there can be other parameters that we need to check. So there are a few things that we need to be really careful on with MBRs. So we already talked that they need more pretreatment, and this is exactly why we recommend a fine screen with rating below two millimeters. We'll talk about uh, more about uh, fine screen in the next slide. Meanwhile, I want to cover also grit and sand that needs to be absent because you can imagine the sand blast membrane basically. Uh, but anyway, you don't want to have uh, grit and sand also in conventional system because otherwise they accumulate and you reduce the fraction of uh, uh, real activity sludge that can process your wastewater. If you are accumulating sand and grit over time, then the ratio between volatile suspended solids and total suspended solids decreases, and then you have less active biomass in the total solids in the system. So it's something you don't want to have uh, nevertheless. Obviously, you need to have a uh, good working activity sludge, healthy activity sludge. So you need a pH between 6 to 9, proper macronutrients, so you have the CNP ratio to, to control, and then to avoid toxic compounds. Because if the activity sludge is healthy, then it's easier to filter it with membranes. If uh, instead you have toxic substances, you are lacking macronutrients and so on, you may have that the, the activated sludge is stressed, so it produces what are called extra polymeric substances that are acting like a funneling layer on the membrane. So you don't want to have that. And finally, you need to control fat, oil, and grease. Uh, for animal and vegetable, you need to be below 100, 150 ppm, while for mineral, you want to be below 10, because this is the capacity that a well-designed bioreactor can tolerate and can process, so you don't have any coming to the membrane creating any fouling. Fine screens. So our, I was mentioning earlier, less than two millimeters is what we want. If possible, it's better less than one millimeter. It's better for the membrane, but it's not mandatory. Still, it's quite inexpensive to get in most, at least industrial installation, and is strongly recommended. Uh, regarding the type of screens, we would we prefer a uh, punch at all and mesh type. We don't really like wedge wire. The reason for this is because wedge wire um, is really not that efficient in the sense that the, the apertures have two different dimensions. You can see here you have round holes, here you have square holes, here the holes are rectangular. So even if it is rated two millimeters, in reality, there is the other direction that is not two millimeters, will likely be five, six millimeters. And so you are not meeting the screening criteria which are really important also to get warranty on the membranes. And obviously, you need to be sure that you don't have any bypass of such fine screens. Otherwise, what is the point of having them? So when we look at the biological reactor, what do we need to consider? Well, design methods and everything that is, you know, you use to design a biological reactor is the same as in conventional activity sludge system. Also, the sludge production is the same if you are using the same sludge age to design. But as we discussed, you can tolerate higher biomass concentration values, up to 12 kilogram per cubic meter in case of submerged system, and up to 30 in size stream. There, there are also limitations on the sludge age you want to use. Anywhere between eight to 60 days 
because lower than that or higher than that creates a sludge that is not that great to filter. Uh, as well, complete nitrification is required because this way you remove all the organic substances before the membrane, so you reduce the falling. We already discussed that if you need a pre denitrification layout, you need to, to take care of the oxygen in the mixed liquor that you are recirculating. And finally, when it comes to the return activated sludge, you need to design it, and this is mostly true for municipal system, in a way that you are sure that you are not overcoming a threshold value for the suspended solids in the mixed liquor in the filtration unit. And different suppliers and configuration of different limits, usually up to 15 to 20 kilo per cubic meter submersion system, and up to 30, 40 for size three ones. As you may already know, the higher the suspended solids in the mixed liquor, the lower gets the alpha coefficient, so the worse gets the oxygen transfer. Here you can see in green the typical value for range, let's say, for submerged system. And in blue, you can see the one for size term system. So here are the recommended value that I would use to design such a biological reactor. So uh, anywhere between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 for submerged one, and 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 um, for size term one. This is true if you don't have really high loadings of readily or um, biodegradable substances. If you are operating uh, in an, let's say, in a non stationary situation and you have a gradient of organics uh, through the bioreactor, you may want to use uh, lower alpha values at the beginning of the reactor because suspended solids are not the only parameter influencing the alpha coefficient, but also the concentration of readily biodegradable substances in the mixed liquid. So, here yeah, and also fat oil increase are worsening the transfer surfactants as well. I mean, there are a few things to be taken in consideration. Also, biological reactors need to ensure that you are not overcoming uh, 27 degrees, otherwise you change the type of bacteria, and so you may, you may have problem. We already discussed about the pH value and the sludge age. It's also recommended to keep fairly low food to mass ratio, but with this sludge age, this come automatically. We discussed already about the mixed liquor uh, solids content in the filtration tank and in the bioreactor. Uh, it's also, you need to have a sl as activated sludge that you need to filter well. So there is a parameter called uh, time to filter of the mixed liquor that needs to have this value. Basically, it's, it can be measured by taking a bit of sludge out, putting it through a paper filter and measuring how much time you need to filter a certain volume. Uh, it's a standard test, which can be easily and inexpensively done on the field. You want to ensure complete nitrification. You want to be sure that the aeration is working in the submerged uh, tank, uh, submerged membrane in the filtration tank. Uh, you want to be sure that the screens are working. So if you take out a sample of the mixed liquor and you put it through a two millimeter sieve, you want to be sure that um, what, get, uh, what is retained is less than two milligram per liter in from your original sample. And then you don't want to have any scaling phenomena. So you may want to check things like calcium, alkalinity, hardness. How does a membrane uh, modular cassette works? Well, we have uh, what is called the filtration cycle. For a certain time, we're pro producing water, so we're extracting the permeate. Then we already mentioned we stop after a certain amount of time. We do relaxation or backwash. And this is repeated for a few times and until every few days we want to do what is called a chemical enhanced backwash. This is only possible if you can backwash the system. You add some chemicals to the backwash to make a better cleaning of the membrane. And then every usually few months or one month, depending on the type of, uh, of effluent that you are treating and the type of membrane configuration, um, you do what is called a cleaning place, which is a soaking in a chemical solution. And then you restart again with your filtration cycle. So you, in reality, you do a lot of production relaxation sub cycles, and then every now and then you enter doing the CIB or the CIP. There are a few parameters to size uh, the membrane filtration unit. I will go really quick over this. Um, the most important is the water flux. That is the 
the permeate flow rate divided by the membrane area. You can distinguish a net or a gross flux. The most important is the net one, which is simply the average uh, permit production over the day divided by the membrane area, which is what you use to size the, uh, the filtration unit. Um, then you have the transmembrane pressure, which is the pressure that you apply to make the water cross the membrane. This is very important and you can measure it in different ways between submerged and side stream system. When you know both the flux and the transmembrane pressure, you can calculate the so-called water permeability, that is the ratio between the flux and the transmembrane pressure, which is very important because it's the constant of the process, of the filtration process. Because if you increase the TMP, you increase the flux, and vice versa, if you reduce the TMP, also you, you reduce the flux. So uh, to really check how a membrane is performing over time, you need to know the permeability. Because if you were changing the pressure, you take this effect out. Uh, as well, the permeability is influenced by the temperature. So uh, you need to take an account of temperature. As a rough indication, uh, you are increasing the permeability or the flux if you are keeping the TMP constant by around 3% for every degree C. The reason for this is because the higher the temperature, the lower the, wo the water viscosity. That means that uh, the water is easier to filter to cross the membrane. So now we will be talking about the membrane filtration tank, which is peculiar, obviously, of submerged system only. And we needed to design in a proper way. So every supplier will give you some dimension because you need to leave some gaps around the membrane modules of cassette. Uh, in a way that you can generate a proper relief effect. Because if you recall, we are injecting air below the, the membrane modules of cassette to keep them clean. And then uh, you need to have around space, uh, you, you need to have enough space around the membrane cassette or module to allow this, this uh, two-phase flow made by mixed liquid and air also to come down. Otherwise, you, you don't have a proper distribution of the flow, you don't have a, a proper hydraulic regime and you're not cleaning the membrane as you should do. Um, also, you don't want to put too many uh, membrane cassettes or module in a filtration tank because the longer you make it, the more you will have a gradient of concentration along the tank. So the, the last cassette perform a little bit worse because they are facing higher um, solids concentration. As well, you cannot put uh, more than two rows in a filtration tank because otherwise the piping becomes really a mess. Uh, then you want any way to keep the tank small enough to avoid having too much volume when you build and also when you do the cleaning. So you waste, you need to use a lot of chemicals to clean if you don't pay attention to the size of the filtration tank. You want to be, to be able to drain completely the filtration tank during the cleaning to be efficient. Uh, and so you put a slope bottom, usually something like 2% is enough. You want to put an inlet baffle in the filtration tank to avoid that the mixed liquor coming into the tank, if it is fed from the bottom, uh, that impacts directly the membrane with the risk of damaging them. And finally, you want to enable scum and foam to basically flow through the filtration tank to avoid accumulation and operating problem. So a typical design of this, you can see here, you have the inlet on the bottom, inlet baffle, slope at bottom, a sump that is, makes the tank really easy to drain because here you will connect your drain pump. And then finally, you have the outlet from the top that enables any foam or scum to simply lift the tank and then goes back to the mixed liquor sump to be recirculated back to the activated sludge reactor or to be simply wasted. Okay, these are some pictures just to give an idea. I mean, how this looks in reality. This is a membrane cassette in the filtration tank. This you can see a few membrane cassette in series within a single filtration tank uh, doing uh, what is called a pressure decay test to test that everything is fine before the startup. You do it during the commissioning usually. And then finally, you see a picture during real operation when filtering the mixed liquor, so you can see the air that is needed for scouring the membrane, how it looks like on the surface. And you want to see that this air is distributed in an even way without any 
pattern with much more bigger course of bubble, then it means you have a problem. So which type of equipment and instruments we need to make a membrane filtration unit work? I mean, membranes are not just the only thing you need. For a submerged system, obviously you have the submerged membrane. You have here a blower that injects the, um, the scouring air that is needed. You usually have one per train. Then here you have the permeate extraction pump, which applies a vacuum on the membrane sucking out the water. And it goes to the permeate holding tank. Then we have the chemical dosing pumps to do the chemical cleaning. Uh, we have uh, here is represented an air trap to uh, separate the air that is present in the permeate to avoid problems when reading uh, the um, flow values, for example, because flow meter don't work really well if you have air bubbles, and also the pressure transmitter have some troubles. Uh, otherwise, you can apply a venturi pump to extract the air. There are a few ways to do it. This is the, probably the simplest with the air trap vessel. And then you have a few instruments. You measure the, uh, oh, sorry, you have the drain pump to drain the tank whenever needed. And then you have a few instruments, um, the level meter in the filtration tank to know what is the level that allows you to calculate the transmembrane pressure. You have also a pressure, you are measuring the pressure of the permeate here. Again, needed to calculate the transmembrane pressure. You have a flow meter to know how much permeate you're extracting, so you can check if you're operating with the right flux or not. And you're measuring the temperature to correct the permeability. And finally, you have a level switch to uh, start the guessing cycle if needed. And you will need to, to at least to have level switches high and low in the permeate holding tank to be sure that it's not empty or too cool. With uh, a side stream system, things are slightly different. Um, I will just discuss what is changing compared to the submerged one. So we are pumping, as we already discussed, the mixed liquid to the membrane. So we have usually a feed pump and then a cross-flow pump to keep enough uh, uh, velocity within the membrane tubes. You usually need anywhere between two to four meters per second. Um, you want then, uh, if you follow the path, so you are producing permit on one side and the concentrate is partially recirculated to the cross-flow pump and then partially sent back to the activated sludge tank from where you also wasted the sludge. Um, then you have a CIP tank where you're put, preparing the cleaning solution with uh, the dosing pump for the cleaners. And then as the instrument, you need to measure the, the feed pressure, the concentrate pressure, and the permeate pressure. This way you can calculate the TMP. And finally, again, you need to measure the permeate uh, flow rate, and you want to measure the temperature in the system to be sure that you can correct for the, uh, for the template. So now um, I would briefly talk about fouling, uh, um, but not really from what fouling is. I mean, fouling is just uh, the uh, deposition, uh, accumulation and absorption of uh, different uh, substances, both organic and inorganic on the membrane, which makes it dirt. And then basically they, build up a layer on the membrane, which makes it more difficult for water to get through. So they, they, it's like putting a resistance in series. Uh, and so you need to clean it to keep the performance. Uh, and depending on the type of fouling, you have different type of cleaning and different type of performances from this clean. So if you remember, we already mentioned that we do relaxation or backwash intervention and the CB, CB and CIP. So, if you are starting to filter, you will see the transmembrane pressure. If you keep the flux constant, which is the most common application in, in MBR, because you need to, to discharge a certain amount of water, uh, you will see the transmembrane pressure increasing because, of course, the membrane gets dirtier. And then you do a relaxation backwash intervention to clean the membrane a bit, and then you bring it down again. And you repeat this a few times until it increases enough or you reach a certain time interval, and then you need to perform a CIB. To clean the membrane better, you add chemicals to the backwash water, and then you gain back more, uh, more TMP in the end. It's more permeability. And you can repeat this again and again until you need to reach a CIP. Usually you do more CIB before you reach a CIP. I just represented one because of space here. Uh, that's a reality you have. Hence, probably of CIB before a CIP. 
and then you do a CAP and you recover a lot. And this until you reach the end life of the membrane. Because with relaxation and backwash, you are removing what is called the physically reversible fouling. Then with CIB, you can easily remove the chemically reversible fouling. With CIP, the reversible fouling. And finally, you have, uh, sorry, with the reversible fouling that is left after CB and, and CIP, then this is accumulating over time. So you will need to increase the transmembrane pressure slightly over time until it, ma it makes no more sense and you need to replace the membrane. But it takes years in MBR application to replace a membrane. Uh, for municipal application, it's 10 years plus, just to give a reference. With industrial, it really depends on the industrial wastewater, but this is usually minimum five years and normally up to eight, 10 years. It's quite common. Um, this is just a brief overview how usually membrane are cleaned, but every supplier have their own procedures. They have different recommendations in terms of concentration, and also they may require specialty cleaners as well. Uh, it's just a rough indication how you do it. With submerged membranes, usually you do both CIB and CIP. Uh, the CIB are more frequent. Um, different is the frequency between municipal and industrial. They are shorter in duration compared to CIP where you soak the membrane for a long time. And also the concentration of chemical you use, they are much lower. The chemical you use usually are cl a chlorine in form of sodium hypochlorite and citric acid. The chlorine is uh, to remove the organic fouling mostly, and the citric acid removes uh, the inorganic fouling. And truth to be said, it's mostly addressed for uh, iron, alum, and so on that are often used as coagulants to remove the uh, the phosphorus to do also chemical precipitation of phosphorus. And if needed in some industrial application, you need you may want to use also other cleaners, other substances, uh, like for example, uh, hydrochloric acid to low, further lower the pH when do the acid cleaning uh, to be sure to, re to dissolve all the scaling parts. Overall, if you have high hardness or um, anyway, calcium that is recommended. With Cestron system, usually you just do a CIP and you tend to use higher concentration overall of acids and to use also specialty cleaners in some tough application like landfill leachate because they are more efficient. It's just usually specialty cleaners are a mixture of chlorine or acids or uh, also strong bases, depends. Uh, um, of course, bases or acids, plus also surfactants that help really to clean well the membrane from the falling particles. There, um, there are some guidelines, I keep it really high level here, but I want to transfer a message that is really important for who is designing uh, MBR system, that is uh, be careful when you, when, uh, you envision the cleaning system and follow the the guidelines of the supplier of the membrane, because uh, otherwise you may risk to void the warranty of the membrane. So you can still test something tailor-made. Usually you want to talk with the supplier of the membrane to, to try something different if you see that the standard procedure is not efficient. And you may want to test just on uh, a small subset of your membrane to avoid any problem on all your installation. And before using a chemical, always check that it's compatible uh, with the membrane, so you need to ask the supplier. Um, for diluting the chemicals, because usually chemicals come quite high in strength and you don't need that. And also often it's not tolerated by the membrane or by the potting of the membrane, you may want to dilute the chemicals. So uh, you can use the service water or you can use the permeate depending on the quality of the permeate. If you have ICOD, you may want not to use it unless you use those additional chemicals to be sure that uh, the existing organics and other substances are not eating up the chemicals that you need to clean the membrane. And finally, inside the system, you may also want to eat up the chemical solution that is more efficient. But you don't do this for submerged system because usually the volume is too much and eating up would take too much energy and too much time. And when do you clean? Well, uh, if the permeability drops below a certain threshold, then the, the system will start automatical cleaning. And also it's very recommended to anyway clean at a regular interval, because even if you don't see the TMP raising too much, you still have fouling happening. And then you may reach a point where cleaning can be really difficult. So you may want anyway to clean every second week or so, or once per month anyway. It's something that you want to discuss with the supplier, depending on the application, but it's very important to still clean at regular time intervals. 
So talking about PCI membranes, PCI membranes uh, has more than 50 years of experience with membrane filtration in different applications. Um, so we know membranes quite a bit, I believe. And um, uh, right now we are part of Medicine Industries that owns Filtration Group, which is a big corporation based in the US, specialized in all filtration applications. So much more than just water and wastewater filtration. There is also air filtration, farm application, and so on, with also different type of filtration media like cartridges and so on. Uh, we are the, the company in the group specialized in membranes, membranes for liquid filtration, and overall for application like water and wastewater, but also more than that. Uh, when it comes uh, to membrane geometries, we are offering tubular membrane, spiral one membrane, but mostly for process application, and all of our membrane is the MBR membrane. Um, we are serving a lot of applications with our tubular membrane, not just the MBR, but also some process application like food and bath. Think about uh, the fruit juice you drink uh, has been clarified with membrane. And if you are living in Europe or in the US, it's very likely that it was clarified with uh, PCS membrane. Uh, pulp and paper to reduce the COD from the production directly. Um, that's the process separation and so on. Um, we have spiral one membrane mostly for food and bath with uh, dairy and protein application, but they uh, they can be also used in wastewater for some specialty use. And then we have um, the oil fiber that uh, for some merchant and beyond. We can support our customer by just providing membrane modules, some engineering services if you need help in putting the members into a system, or if you want to buy a system. We have partnership with many workshops all over the world to build a system, possibly locally, uh, at a convenient price for you. So you don't you don't need to worry and you can buy a plug and play solution. Overall, when we're talking about size stream MBR, we can do this. So what have we, we been doing recently? Well, I mean, we our first MBR installation this back in the 90s, and a few years back, we also introduced the submerged ones uh, with, in a, quite a few success in these last years with many installations over Europe, and we are getting a very good momentum. And this is coming mostly because of the features of our product, which I want now to cover. I'm accelerating slightly, as you may notice, because I'm mindful of the time. Uh, so we have our side stream MBR membrane, that uh, tubular membrane, eight millimeter diameter PVDF membrane. Uh, usually 100 or 200 kilodalton as pore size. And they are available in eight inches diameter, also 10 inches if you want. Um, and they have a GRP vessel. So they, uh, they are fairly easy to move around and inexpensive to install because uh, it's a price competitive product in my opinion. When it comes to submerged membranes, we have a lot of other membranes. We have two product lines, uh, one called GMBR, is uh, equipped with a conventional aeration system, so with releasing uh, medium-sized bubbles below the membranes to scour them. Again, it's a PVDF membrane, 0, 0 0.2 micron. And it's a supported membrane, so you can apply quite high pressure. Uh, also for backwash, we can reach up to 1.5 bar, which I think is really impressive. And a very, very high chlorine tolerance. So that, that ensures a, a long membrane lifetime. We have also the more advanced version called ZMBR2 that has a different aeration system on the bottom, uh, which releases um, air in pulses, is a pulse aeration device, uh, which allows it to reduce the air consumption. So uh, air is injected continuously in this chamber until it reaches a critical pressure and then is released. And then you have a big bubble of air uh, rising through the membranes and scouring them. And so you can see that the air demand is lower, which uh, is probably one of the lowest on the market. We can reach uh, what is called a SAD, so um, scoring air demand per unit of uh, membrane area as low as 0 0.087 uh, cubic meter per hour per square meter of membrane. So it's really a competitive product. And the very interesting thing for both the ZMBR and, and GMBR is that we can. Uh, also 
customize the size of the frame within some limits. But we can add a few more modules or take them out, uh, both reducing also the size of the frame so that we can really fit to your tanks. That's the reason why, for example, we recently won a tender uh, for a wastewater treatment plant where it was an upgrading and place was really uh, limited. And we changed slightly the size of our cassette to really fit as much membrane area as available in the limited space. So we can be really a uh, good partner when you need also to customize uh, uh, a bit your, your MBR solution. So now, Emily, I'm asking you to push out the poll for our audience. It's a very simple question. Um, yes, as I've, I've been talking a while. I mean, I would like to see if any of you would like to be contacted to further discuss a bit more about uh, all this information that we provided. So if you say yes, I will be sure to reach you or one of my team in a way that we can talk and understand how PCI can help you with your MBR project and also train your team if required to use our product. We're more than happy to share our knowledge. And unfortunately this webinar, uh, I could just touch on uh, high level topics only. Okay, uh, I think we can close the poll. Thank you very much for everybody who chose to vote. And moving on, a little summary of what I've been talking through in the last 50 minutes or so. So MBRs are an established technology nowadays. I mean, they have, they have been around since the 90s on a large scale. Uh, the first research on MBR technologies dates way back. Uh, and they can really help you if you need to get really high quality affluence, as well if you need post treatments and so on. Um, but you need to be careful when choosing the right type of membrane and to design the system around it. We mentioned that pretreatment are really a key to make the MBR working properly. And you need to be in touch with suppliers to understand the right operating parameters and how to make the layout of the filtration unit. We discussed that there are two configurations, submerged and side stream, and each one has pro and cons. So there is not a unique choice. And this is also what makes this type of uh, projects really interesting because uh, it's about every time finding the right type of membrane for your project. And we believe that the PCI, having a very wide membrane knowledge, not just in wastewater, and uh, one of the largest product portfolio in the market, because uh, we are among the few producers of MBR uh, members that offer both side stream and submerge. Most, most producers offer just one of the two. So we can really you know, help you in your support uh, and give you support in your MBR projects and be totally unbiased because depending on the project, we can uh, recommend you one or the other, but in the end, you will always choose the right type. We just hint you what, in our opinion, makes more sense, but of course, you are the one taking the decision and we don't want to force you towards one dire direction or another. And so that's pretty much everything on my side for today. Here you can see how to reach uh, uh, the MBR page on our website, which is uh, obviously www.pcimembrance.com uh, and then you can see through industries and then MBR page. And Emily, I don't know if we received any questions. I see there are a few messages anyway in the chat uh, and yep. a few questions for the Q&A. So I'm more than happy to stay uh, also after the, the, the end of the webinar to answer as many questions as possible. Thanks, Nigra, for this great presentation. It seems like we do have some questions. Uh, so the first question is, what is the typical maximum TSS content acceptable for submerged and set stream configuration? So I think this has been mentioned, but I can repeat it without finding the slide now. So with submerged uh, M uh, MBR, you may want, depending on the, on the configuration, if you are using all of fiber membrane, 
uh, most of the producer will ask you to not go over 15 gram per liter of um, uh, suspended solids in the filtration tank with the normal condition being 12, anywhere between 10 to 12. So then depending on the recirculation ratio that you are using uh, with the bioreactor, you can calculate how much is the concentration of the bioreactor. So for example, very common numbers are you put eight grams per liter in the bioreactor and you have uh, with a recirculation ratio of five, uh, 10 grams on the membranes, uh, 10, gram, 10 grams per liter. So that's uh, usually a fairly standard situation to design a submerged MBR. Also because uh, if you remember, we we're discussing about the alpha factor. So you don't want to increase too much the biomass concentration uh, to avoid uh, very poor oxygen transfer. With so, uh, with cistern membrane instead, uh, you choose them if you, uh, of course, if you have low footprint, so you can push this more. Uh, so usually you can have uh, up to 15, 20 grams per liter in the bioreactor and then 30 to 40 on the membranes, depending on uh, the ratio that, uh, that you're using to recirculate the activity sludge. And then at that point with those concentration, often it becomes really interesting to use pure oxygen instead of air to oxygen at the biomass. I hope this uh, answers the question. Otherwise, uh, feel free to reach me. Uh, by the way, here you can find my email and I'm happy to elaborate further. Thanks, Nicola, for your answer. Then we have also other questions. So one is typical, what is the typical average energy consumption for submerged and side stream MBR? Yeah, of course, uh, there, is a, there is a difference. I mean, with submerged MBR, it depends of course, I give some indicative range. It depends on the particular situation, on the type of membrane that you are using and so on. With submerged MBR can be as low as 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.3 kilowatt per cubic meter per minute. With side stream, instead, we are significantly higher because we are around 10 times more. I mean, 2 to 5 uh, kilowatt hour per cubic meter of per minute. Thanks, Nicola. Um, another question from uh, one of our participants is um, M uh, is about MLSS. Uh, so MLSS plays a big role during the operation of MBR. Means if MLS is low, MBR get choked easily, or higher MIS can easily choke the MBR. Uh, well, if it is low, not really. Uh, if it is high, yes. I mean, uh, uh, there was a parameter was. Uh, I didn't stop discussing about is the so-called solid flux. So basically when you are putting a flux of water to the membrane, you are also applying at the same time a solid flux because you're pushing a certain concentration to the membrane. So it's basically the water uh, flux multiplied by the solids concentration that you have. And uh, the most of the supplier will, uh, will uh, give you fluxes based on the assumption that you are not pushing more than 10, 12 grams per liter if we're talking about submerged membrane uh, towards the membrane. Otherwise, you need to lower. But you can go higher. I mean, also with submerged that we discussed, there is a limit of around 12, 15. But in reality, if you tolerate much lower fluxes, you can uh, you can go higher. I mean, the submerged membrane has been used, for example, for a, a sludge thickening application where you can reach usually 2, 3%, so 20, 30 uh, even 40 grams per liter, but then the flux drops by a factor of at least three or four, and then you just need more membrane area. It's uh, usually not recommended to use it uh, for such a such high concentration of submerged membrane uh, in the main line, um, so to separate solid and liquid, but to concentrate sludge, you can use it. And um, so the membranes will not really get clogged unless you, you really reach a, an a, normal uh, content of suspended solids. Um, so I still remember, and again, there is a reason why there is this 40 gram per liter, because then the viscosity starts to increase, you're dewatering a lot, and then you may end up clogging the membrane with this amount. Uh, also with all fiber, yes, you can get clogged uh, at this concentration, but yeah, this is really a limited scenario. On the lower bottom side, um, yeah, there is also, Usually it's recommended to not go below six gram per liter or so in normal operation um, for a few reasons. One is because of course, uh, 
there will be not much of advantage of, of using an MBR below this threshold. Uh, at that point, you can use a conventional activity slash system. I would say the clarifier will not be limited uh, factor. Yeah. And the other one is, of course, uh, if you really get low on uh, on the on the sludge content, then you may end up also have uh, uh, colloids that have not been fluctuated by the activated sludge. We can close for clogging on the membrane, so you lose permeability. So yeah, the the sweet spot is again between anywhere between six uh, to ten for submerged MBR in the biological reactor. So you can reach 12, 12 15 on the membrane. And for the side stream, anywhere between six to to twenty in the biological reactor, and up to forty on the membrane. Uh, again, submerged membrane can tolerate more than 12, 15, but you need to lower the flux, and then you can reach twenty, thirty without any problem. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, meanwhile, we also have questions about uh, blower. Uh, mm -hmm. first question about blower is, is it necessary to use a blower per train or can a single blower be used for multiple trains? And uh, then another participant also asked, what blower technology do you recommend for submerged MBR applications? Thank you very much for this question. They're both excellent. So um, the first one, uh, it's also possible to use uh, common blowers. Um, it depends on, so the safest from the operation point of view is to have one blower per train and then, and then one common spare. Because uh, you need to take care when you are not, uh, for example, if you have more trains, then you at times you may need to drain the tank during the CIP cleaning, for example. Um, and then you need to close the ration valve to that. Uh, to that particular train and uh, change the, the speed of the blower or the common blowers to compensate that there is not a blower on service. And sometimes also you may have slightly different water levels because uh, you are performing a cleaning and so on. And so you need to modulate the valves to avoid that too much air goes to one train than the other. So it, it is possible, but I'm not sure it makes uh, for savings uh, because overall, uh, um, after a certain size, it's not recommended to go anyway with blowers. And you need uh, much more sophisticated controls. Uh, you need to start considering uh, some um, valves, uh, automated valves uh, with uh, some flow control on it. So it's it's not uh, it's not recommended usually. You can do it, but it needs careful. So if you want to go this way, we need, we need to talk together to really find the best way to be sure that uh, the aeration is done properly to all the trains when there are, for example, uh, cleaning intervention running. That is the critical part. Or you are simply taking uh, disconnecting a train uh, from the process. Uh, regarding the type of blowers, um, normally you tend to use um, conventional centrifugal blowers uh, or uh, rotary loop blowers, depending on the size of the system. Centrifugal for small installation um, and the rotary loop for larger installation. The reason for this you don't need, for example, the turbo blowers because the capacity, uh, the, the back pressure that is required is not high. I mean, filtration tank are not that deep. The, uh, it depends on the supplier, actually. There are some flat sheet memory supplier that can make tank quite deep somewhere around five meters high, but still uh, still is, is enough to use a rotary loop. And um, that is basically the threshold to switch to turbo. Instead, for most hollow fiber, the filtration tank are deep three and a half meters or even lower. So it's not required to go to turbo. Thanks, Nicola. Another question from our participant is uh, about the uh, BNR system. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, are you doing bio um, biology process calculation for full BNR system uh, for MBRs, any tool are you uh, are you using? Do you have the two available? Um, we can do some calculation as a recommendation, high level recommendation. No membrane supplier will uh, will uh, do the calculation in your place. So the responsibility is still on you. We can check if uh, uh, if the system is properly designed in terms of sludge agents or not, according to um, to our calculation. We are using the German standard, the DWA 131. But uh, if you want to do more sophisticated calculation, 
You can also use the conventional uh, models like BioWin, uh, West, uh, and so on. Um, the issue is that always you need to have the data to use such models because we can also do calculation based on CO2 fractionation, but you need to give us the fractionation of the CO2. Thanks, Nicola. One last question in the QR uh, is, please explain difference between membranes and cassettes. Also, please tell us how to select number of membranes based on capacity of the plant. Yeah, that's a very good question, which uh, is uh, requires quite a lengthy explanation. So let's try me to summarize as much as possible. So. Uh, membranes per se is just the part that is filtered in the water. So, uh, for example, uh, if we take the hollow fiber cassette, you could see all these fibers, white fibers in between. Uh, then these this membrane are usually potted or fixed to uh, to what is called modular cassette. Um, in a way that you fix the membrane uh, to a frame or into you put them and you put it to a vessel in a way that the membrane can be used because the membrane per se uh, you cannot use it as it is because it's open i mean you cannot separate the uh, the feed from uh, and concentrate from the permeate you need to put some uh, uh, some limits around it and this is done usually by potting and then putting it to into a vessel if it is a tubular membrane or uh, then the potty then are connected to specially designed plastic parts on the on the bottom and upper end, and then these are fixed into a frame where it basically can collect the permeate, or in the other case, uh, to push the feed the concentrate through in case of a tubular uh, membrane. So that basically you can separate the permeate from the rest. That is the function of this, and then to give it a shape because the membrane is not substanding. I mean, you have or a simple tube. That is, looks like an empty pipe, and that is a tubular membrane. How it looks like, or a non fiber membrane. Sorry for the analogy. Looks like a white spaghetti, which is uh, standing, but you cannot do anything with it. You cannot apply a suction directly on it. You need to have some connection, and this connection are provided by the potted end. So I hope that clarifies the difference between what is a membrane and then what is a modular cassette. And then modular cassette is just about name. I mean, uh, mostly flat sheet uh, membrane suppliers uh, uh, call modules, uh, and uh, the, the basically the membrane module you buy, uh, and also the the size term one, the tubular one are called modules. While the cassette, the hollow fiber um, submerged membrane are usually called cassette, and then modules are just a little block building up the cassette. It's just about names. In the end you need, let's say, a, a membrane block that you can call it cassette or module. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, ah, how, oh. how much membrane you need? Yes. How much membrane yeah. you need? Well, uh, it depends on the application because it depends on the flux you can choose uh, and, of course, on the type of membrane that you are using. So uh, we can give recommendation for fluxes about our membrane. Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, it really depends. For example, if I have to say a number, you take a uh, dairy effluent for an industrial system and you use our submerged membranes, you will have a flux that you can use around uh, 14 to 16 liter per square meter per hour. So knowing how much, you know, is the permit that you have to produce, which is usually how much water is coming in, let's say, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say 100 cubic meters per day. So uh, that is 100,000 liters. We divided by 24. We are at 4,167 liters per hour. We divided by, let's take an average value, 15 liters per square meter per hour. You need around 280 square meters of membrane. So it depends on the type of membrane, because if I would be using instead a size stream membrane, MBR, I would have used a flux of 80. So the, the membrane area that I would have used would have been simply 52 square meter, which sounds much lower, but then the system is very different. So it depends on the top of the system and on the application. And on top, this was under the assumption that I use quite standard suspended solids content. Otherwise, uh, if they are higher, I need to lower the flux. So if you have a, spe a specific application in mind, contact us and we can go through this.
I see Henry just replied that she would like to uh, see an image. Uh, I suggest that we can contact her after this yeah. webinar to uh, share more information. Absolutely. I will be contacting you so that we can discuss this. Uh, any other quick question? Otherwise, I think we already run enough over time. It seems like we've answered all the questions. Thank okay. you, Nicola. So I will be picking up this last question to better explain the difference between the membrane and modus of cassette. Uh, putting together also quick image to better explain it because I don't have it ready. I'm sorry about that. So thank you everybody for joining us. I hope it was interesting. Uh, again, do not hesitate to contact us if you have a project or if you want more information. We're more than happy to help. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, thank we you, will Emily. send uh, the presentation to everyone after this webinar. Thanks yeah. for your participation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a lovely day. Bye.